Hello, everyone, and welcome to AWCI's webinar, U.S. Construction Outlook, Torrid or TEPED. Thank you for joining us today. This webinar is sponsored by the Foundation of the Wall and Ceiling Industry, and I am Tao Wen, AWCI's Education Program Manager. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Ken Simonson. Ken has been Chief Economist for the Associated General Contractors of America, AGC, the leading trade association for the construction industry since 2001. Ken has more than 40 years of experience analyzing, advocating, and communicating about economic and tax issues. So welcome, Ken. Well, thank you. And I apologize both for the late start for those of you not familiar with AGC of America, we have 89 chapters around the country and represent general contractors, specialty trade contractors, and uh, subcontractors, as well as suppliers of equipment, goods, and services. So uh, I do hope that you'll contact your local chapter to learn more and uh, hopefully you've already had some helpful uh, interaction with them. What I want to talk about today is what's going on with the uh, construction labor. Uh, materials, cost, and supply chain, and then the outlook for different segments of construction. So uh, let me start with the, the employment picture. The, uh, the green line here shows that headline figure that we'll be getting an update on on Friday morning, the year-over-year -year change in total payroll non-farm employment. And back in January 2022, it was growing at a very store torrid 5% year-over-year rate. Considering that population growth is only about half a percent, this clearly wasn't sustainable. And indeed, it has slowed down. The most recent figure so far available is for August. It was up 1.5%. Again, uh, still much better than total population growth. But what's really striking is how strongly non-residential construction has been growing, and that even residential construction uh, employment has outpaced total non-farm in recent months. Non-residential covers building contractors, specialty trade contractors, whether they're working on building or uh, infrastructure, and uh, heavy and civil engineering firms. And you can see that in the latest 12 months, their growth was 3.5% year over year, more than double that of the overall economy. And as the next slide shows, uh, that growth is widespread. Uh, from August of last year to August of this year, 39 states added construction employees. Only 10 states had a decline. The decline uh, is somewhat concentrated uh, in the Northeast and in uh, Minnesota and Colorado, and then uh, typically uh, Oregon and sometimes Washington State also have been in decline. At the moment, the strongest growth has been in Alaska and Hawaii uh, and Nevada, but uh, basically, most of the country in green, meaning a year-over-year -year increase in employment. So you might think there's no problem getting workers if you weren't involved in the industry. I'm sure all of you have a different take on that, though. One other figure from the government shows that despite the strong uh, growth in employment, contractors really want to hire a lot more workers. These figures came out yesterday. They're from the series BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, puts out called Job Openings and Labor Turnover Survey, or JOLTS. And here I've taken the data for August uh, for every year in the history of the survey, which now uh, extends from 2001 through this year. The blue line shows the number of job openings on the last day of the month. So it's essentially a snapshot. And while the number uh, dipped slightly from a year ago, you can see it's still uh, one of the highest August 31st totals in the history of that series. Meanwhile, the number of people hired has stayed in a fairly tight range between 300,000 300, and 400,000 every August. And for the last four years, uh, job openings on a single day and hires, which covers the entire 31-day month, have just about been equal, meaning that contractors, in spite of keeping up the hiring, want to bring on board twice as many people as they're able to find. Another important data point from the JOLTS figures is layoffs. If, con if companies think that they're not going to have as much work going forward, uh, they will lay people off when the current project finishes. But in fact, the layoff rate uh, has been, at this, in August of this year, 
was the second lowest in the history of the series. So clearly, even companies that don't have an immediate uh, need for workers, uh, they would want to hang on to them because they see more work coming. HEC of America does a survey every summer to find out what companies' experience has been and what they expect with regard to workforce issues. And this year, we got over almost 1,500 responses from contractors in every state. So while it's not a statistically valid or scientific sample, uh, it certainly is a large one. And we found that 94% of the firms that directly hire hourly craft workers said that they had openings as of uh, June 30th. That was up from 85% of the firms a year ago. And similarly, there was an increase in firms with openings for salaried workers. Nearly 80% of the firms this year compared to 69% a year ago. Of the firms with openings, 94% of those looking for craft workers said those positions were hard to fill. And again, that was an increase in difficulty from a year ago. And 92% of firms with opening for salaried workers said the same. Again, an increase from a year ago. Not every position has gotten harder, however. Uh, the ones that have uh, seen the biggest increase in difficulty to fill, surveyors, estimating personnel, pipe fitters, and welders. Whereas other positions have gotten easier, traffic control personnel and laborers and environmental compliance personnel. I think the difference here is that the positions that have gotten harder are all ones that you need specialized training and uh, construction industry experience for. And those are the ones that firms uh, are trying their best to hang on to the people they have or get them from somebody else because the pipeline producing uh, trained workers just has been inadequate. But uh, with the broader economy seeing that big slowdown in hiring, uh, the uh, Positions that you can switch from one industry to another without specialized training, such as laborers or folks who are holding up signs telling you to stop or go along a road that's under construction, those positions have gotten easier. We also asked firms, why were they having trouble filling positions? 62% said that available candidates are not qualified to work in the industry. Either they didn't have experience, they had a blemish on their record or they didn't have a credential such as a commercial driver's license or uh, uh, handling of specialized equipment. Also, 50% of the firms showed that they were being, said that they were being ghosted. New hires either failed to show up or they quit shortly after starting. So I'm afraid these problems are not gonna go away, but uh, I do expect uh, as long as demand remains as strong as we've seen, so will the problems of filling positions. What's the effect been on wages? The blue and black lines here trace series that come out with the employment report called Average Hourly Earnings for Production and Non-Supervisory Employees. It's a long way of describing uh, the uh, average wages for craft workers and uh, office workers who aren't supervisors. And this again tracks a year over year change going back to the month before the pandemic started. February 2020. The black line shows this series for, for non-residential building contractors. And for over three years now, uh, starting back in mid-2021, those wages have been going up at about a 5% rate. They dipped a little bit in July to a 4.6% increase, but that's still well above what we're seeing for the total non-farm sector. And uh, Wages for firms working in heavy and civil engineering rose as much as 10% on a year-over-year -year basis for these craft workers. That's cooled off just lately, uh, but uh, as uh, we get into a pickup for the kinds of projects they're doing, and I'll get to that in a minute, I expect those wages also will continue rising at a 5% rate. So I uh, do expect to have to continue to pay higher wages in the year ahead even while other industries may be getting more relief. The red line shows yet another series from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Producer Price Index. Uh, we'll get the uh, September figures in uh, the end of next week. Uh, for now, uh, this shows July. We do have August numbers, and I'll show you some of those in a minute. Uh, but I, I kept this uh, series at uh, July just to compare with the latest uh, wage increases. So basically, we've seen a huge volatility 
in the cost of materials and some services that go into non-residential construction. That's what this line is tracing. Back when the pandemic hit in early 2020, uh, those prices actually fell below the year before level. And that's why that red line went below the zero mark. But later in the year, we saw record prices for lumber, steel, copper, diesel fuel, and much more frequent than previously increases for uh, gypsum products, insulation materials, roofing materials, and uh, plastic pipe. So for 12 straight months, that index was going up at 20% or more rate. It finally started cooling off in the summer of 2022. By the middle of 2023, it was actually declining again compared to where it had been at its peak. This year, it has hovered just above the zero mark. Uh, so we have very little inflation going on. Uh, in materials costs. How about supply chain? Well, that's a major reason that these costs came down. Supply chains generally got back to normal. Two big exceptions are switch gear and transformers. Those still have unprecedented lead times. And then one other issue that I was hearing about earlier this year, uh, long delays, in fact, the uh, blockage of posting new orders for rock, uh, for wool, rock oil insulation. Um, I believe that that situation, uh, the, the producers may be catching up. So at the moment, I don't expect to hear more problems on that. But certainly uh, the damage in the Southeast and the port strike are going to complicate supply chains again, uh, potentially for many months. So uh, that may turn into an upturn in this uh, materials cost index again. Have to keep an eye on that but I am concerned about lingering effects from the port strike if it isn't solved right away. Well, let me go on and show a couple of examples of things that are still volatility, volatile. While most costs have settled down uh, from August of last year to August of this year, uh, there was a, essentially no change in the price of goods going into non, new non-residential construction. Uh, but copper has swung both ways, copper futures went from $4 a pound to five, back down to four, now around 450. So copper products such as pipe and insulation and fittings, uh, the PPI, the producer price index for that, dropped almost 2% from July to August, but it's up 10% year over year. Steel mill products have been going down all year, down 14% year over year. And diesel, which was up early in the year, now down 22%. So in general, things look good on materials costs. Let me move on to what's happening in market segments. Uh, this data came out from the Census Bureau at the uh, yesterday morning, and it shows the change in what they call value put in place, spending by contractors on projects underway uh, in August uh, compared to August of 2023. Total construction spending up 4%, but uh, private, residential, and non-residential, very balanced until we get into the details, which I'll do in a moment. The uh, non-residential categories, you can see a huge range. Data centers up 57%, office excluding data centers down 14%, and a lot in between. But within these broad categories, there is also disparity. So let me take you into that. Census Bureau on its construction spending website, census.gov slash construction spending. The press release only shows you uh, what was on the previous screen, but on their uh, more detailed historical data page, they have information on uh, the spending on over 160 non-residential categories. So starting from the top, private residential was up 3% year over year. But within that, single family almost flat, multifamily down 8%, and improvements, that's additions and renovations to existing homes, up 9%. Going forward, now that the mortgage rate for 30 year fixed mortgages has dropped from almost 8% to 6%, I think we will see more single family home building. Multifamily, while the short term interest rate cut will help developers a little on their financing costs. There's still a glut of housing uh, coming, of apartments coming to some of the hotter markets. Rents have dropped for now. So I don't expect multifamily 
to pick up before 2026. I think further decline in this figure likely throughout next year. And then improvements, again, homeowners uh, will benefit from both uh, the um, fact that more people are interested in buying a home, can afford to buy, and the fact that short-term interest rates are easing a bit. So I think improvements will remain positive through next year. Non-residential construction has slowed quite a bit. It was showing double-digit growth last year, and in fact, very balanced 18% growth for both private and public construction. You can see that they have slowed dramatically, and particularly on the private side. The bullets here go through the census categories in descending order of August 2024 size. And within uh, each category, there are parentheses showing what's happened to some of the subcategories also listed in descending order of August 2024 size. So uh, the biggest manufacturing construction still growing at a hot 18% rate. That makes it not only the biggest, but the fastest growing non-residential segment. The Within it, computer electronic and electric manufacturing, that covers the huge semiconductor fabrication plants or fabs that are going up around Phoenix, Austin, Columbus, but also Boise, uh, Lehigh, Utah, upstate New York, Hillsborough, Oregon, uh, those growing at a very rapid 24% rate. I think that growth will slow but continue next year. Transportation equipment, currently the fastest growing category, that covers the giant vehicle and battery plants for them. Uh, but uh, in the last few months, uh, most of the manufacturers have either scaled back or delayed projects, canceled some, uh, or at least postpone them indefinitely. So I think this category, the subcategory will slow quite a bit. However, I do think we will see more manufacturing plants announced as companies want to shorten the supply chain, uh, get away from actual and potential conflict areas and uh, qualify under the Build America, Buy America Act. So I think manufacturing construction will continue to grow in 2025, though probably not at double digit rates, close to it. Power construction, uh, we're seeing strong growth in solar and in utility scale battery storage. Neither of those, of course, call for uh, much uh, wall or ceiling work, so won't spend time on it, except to say, I do expect them to continue growing strongly next year. Likewise, highway and street construction, finally getting some of that Infrastructure Investment Job Act money should be growing well uh, in 2025. Now, commercial is a term that gets used in a lot of different ways. For census, it covers warehouse, retail, and farm construction. Weight, warehouse was the fastest growing category in 2020 through 2022, uh, but now really plunging, particularly the big million square foot warehouses. There's still demand for replacement or modernization of the smaller warehouses. Uh, there's demand for warehouses around some of the big manufacturing plants and cold storage still looks like a strong market. <laughs> Retail, uh, the, the downtown areas still uh, looking very grim, not likely to revive. But to the extent that people are working from home or have moved to uh, newer areas, there is demand for mixed use and local retail uh, connected with that housing and those uh, job locations. Education construction up on both the primary, secondary, and higher ed level. I think primary, secondary will continue to benefit from uh, the increase in property tax revenue from higher house prices and more properties being added to tax rolls but higher ed likely to slow down as the uh, college and university population continues to decline. Office construction, uh, Census Bureau finally in July started breaking out data centers, not in their press release, unfortunately. You have to dig into these uh, huge tables to find these numbers, but uh, you can see how important that is because what they report on the press release shows a 2% increase when you split it apart, data centers up 57%, other private office down 15%. And I'll show you in a second how that has continued to diverge. And then transportation, a mix of modes and public and private. At the moment, airport activity happening everywhere. 
I can tell you from firsthand experience just half an hour ago that it's still busy here at Denver International, but plenty of other places also. Um, so I think, uh, and wherever I go, I see temporary walls put up. So I, I know that that's good for some of you. Um, other kinds of transportation, uh, not of as much interest, I suspect, to you, and uh, a varied results there. Uh, healthcare, hospital doing well. I think that that is a post-COVID impact in that hospitals had to stop their uh, expansion plans during COVID. Now they're catching up, but I think over time, more care will be delivered through specialized facilities outside of the hospital setting, whether in medical office buildings or special care facilities. And then across the bottom of the screen are the smaller Census Bureau categories. Uh, so one last look at what's happening to data centers and uh, private offices. Uh, data centers off the top of the chart, a 57% year over year increase, increasing just about every month uh, for the past two years. I think it will continue to grow next year, uh, maybe tapering off to a 20% increase, but that's pretty damn good uh, compounded after two years of growth like this. And meanwhile, uh, the private uh, office uh, falling right off the bottom of the chart. I don't see that picking up uh, for at least a couple of years, except to the extent that there are a few properties that are being converted uh, to either hotel or residential use. So to wrap it up, I think economic growth is going to continue, but continue to slow down. I think uh, that the single family market is headed for a revival, both for new construction and uh, continued growth in uh, remodeling. Uh, but uh, multifamily steep decline will continue at least until late next year. Office and warehouse also headed for steep drops, although smaller and niche uh, warehouses should do okay. Uh, but the, the negatives on uh, multifamily and uh, non-residential will be outweighed by uh, continuing strong growth in data center and alternative energy, selected categories of infrastructure and manufacturing plants. Uh, I think the biggest problem for contractors will be, continue to be labor availability. And so labor costs will continue to rise more than for other industries. And for now, we have huge uncertainty about, of course, the election, but also uh, what impact the port strike will have. And at least for some suppliers, uh, what uh, the damage in the Southeast will mean uh, for their plants or uh, for bringing goods in from elsewhere. So let me close with a map that shows you where population has been growing. Unfortunately, the map is a year out of date. The Census Bureau won't provide its 2024 estimates until December. Uh, but what we see here is the U.S. population grew by almost half a percent, just about the same as it did before the pandemic. Uh, eight states did lose population, the ones in deep red. But that was a big improvement over the 18 states that lost population the year before. Growth is concentrated in the Southeast, in Texas, in the Intermountain West, and in South Dakota and Delaware. Uh, the, the slowest growth, the ones in pink and the ones losing population, all over the Northeast and midsection of the country, and the Pacific Coast states, including Alaska and Hawaii. I do think these trends are going to continue. Although the movement away to more rural areas certainly has slowed down. Some of the uh, states that have benefited initially, like uh, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and uh, Montana, they've all shown slower growth. And so I think that will continue. Growth will be concentrated in those green and bright green states. So uh, let me leave it there, but invite any of you to uh, send me emails at ken.simonson at agc.org. If you want a full, an updated set of the slides after the employment report comes out on Friday, or uh, you have any questions, or you want to get on the email list for the Data Digest, that's my weekly summary of economic news relevant to construction. And as you can see listed here, we have lots of other information at agc.org. We'll stop there, uh, see if uh, there are any questions uh, posted online, or you want to open the mics for them, and uh, also, uh, feel free to send me questions to answer by email later. Um, thank you, Ken. So we have a couple of questions coming in here. Uh, when do you think multifamily will recover? 
you know, it, that really depends on a number of factors. First, are we going to continue to get uh, economic and particularly job growth? I think the answer to that is yes, though at a slower rate. Um, it also depends on where the population growth and movement is going to occur. So I do think that uh, that map and the update that uh, we'll see for it in December are important. Uh, and then also what's happening uh, with single family construction. Uh, so a, a lot of moving pieces there mean that uh, multifamily, uh, I think basically will be healthy in the areas where the population is continuing to grow, uh, but it will take time to absorb all the apartments that are coming on the market right now. So Austin, for instance, one of the fastest growing metro areas in the country, uh, nevertheless, the apartment developers got out over their uh, big cowboy boots and uh, put too many apartments out there for rent at the same time. So rents have actually slipped, effective rents by about 3%. Uh, once those are absorbed, and it may take all of next year or uh, into 2026, I think growth will resume there. Other areas that uh, had uh, seen uh, good growth in uh, apartment construction, uh, it may not come back for a while longer, particularly uh, if the population growth slows. For instance, here in Denver, we had huge population growth, huge growth in apartments, but now the population growth has slowed down. Uh, office uh, occupants are moving away to cheaper cities. Residents have been moving to uh, northern Utah and into Idaho. Uh, and so uh, it may take a very long time for some of those apartments to fill up. And as a result, I don't expect development to come back. So uh, just answering on a national level, I think uh, next year will be highly negative for multifamily. Coming off that, that valley, that whole uh, 2026 should look positive, but it'll vary a lot by metro area. So based on the topic, the title of your webinar is U.S. construction torrid or tepid? Oh, <laughs> some of each. I, I, I don't like to sound like the traditional two-handed economist, but huge differences. So as, as I indicated, things like uh, data centers, some manufacturing, um, and some warehouse ditches will be pretty torrid. Uh, and then outside of the, the areas that need walls or ceilings, a uh, good year for most types of infrastructure. I guess one other category that uh, you will see a lot of uh, wall work, uh, uh, airport terminals being expanded and constant churn of the retailers in them. Also some uh, retail uh, tenant replacement in some areas, new retail growing in some areas. So all of those markets, I would say, uh, will be uh, at, at least moderately hot some of them will be torrid uh but uh, others uh, definitely a chill so, so others economists have predicted a mild recession in 2025 what are your thoughts on a potential recession one of the hats i, I wear is a editor and sometimes okay. spokesman for uh, quarterly surveys of business economists. I'm a past president of the professional organization, the National Association for Business Economics. They put out their latest uh, summary of 32 economic forecasts uh, this Monday. And uh, basically the view is that recession won't happen before 2026. As always, there's a range of views, but I would characterize the outlook as uh, more optimistic uh, in avoiding recession than I've seen in a couple of years. And I share that. Uh, economic growth has cooled off, but it's still occurring. Job growth has slowed, but it's still occurring. And I think uh, that will continue through 2025. Uh, beyond that, my crystal ball clouds up. So I'm not ready to predict the recession, but to say I don't expect one in 2025. So with the recent storm and destruction to some of the southern Let me think. I'm, I'm hearing too much in the background. Okay, go ahead. So with some of the destruction from the storm of the southern um, southern states, how has that affect the construction economy? Well, it's too early to say what the impact from Helene will be, particularly uh, what will the impact on supply of certain materials but uh, historically, 
storms uh, first they create opportunity for for cleanup debris removal and and stabilization of damaged structures um, takes much longer uh, to rebuild and replace of course so uh, the net impact is not positive for construction overall but it's also uh, not generally negative beyond the areas that that are hit hard uh, people sometimes assume oh this is great for construction because you need to replace all this stuff well until the uh, government money or the insurance money comes through uh, that doesn't necessarily happen and many businesses close permanently some people move away so uh, economic or construction activity that would have happened instead gets canceled and the net impact isn't always positive it took homestead florida decades to recover from the hurricane that just Hurricane Andrew that almost wiped it out in 1991, for instance. Uh, and the uh, population of New Orleans has never gotten back to pre-Katrina levels. On the other hand, some areas do rebound pretty quickly. Houston has been hit by storm after storm and it, it has come back. Uh, but we'll really have to see if there are production facilities or uh, transportation networks that have out of commission for a significant time to know what the impact of the storm will be uh, on uh, construction downstream. Thank you, Ken. That concludes our Q&A session. On behalf of AWCI, thank you, Ken, and thank you to our attendees for joining us. I apologize for the delay. Um, thank you to the Foundation of the Wall and Ceiling Industry for sponsoring this webinar. Join us next week, October 9th, for Introduction to Rain Screen Walls, an AIA accredited webinar with Raina. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you for your patience.